I am here to introduce to you Ryan McHugh. He is uh, the director of engineering at Human Made. We had a Human Made reference earlier in the day uh, with uh, Tom Wilmot as the Harry Potter of WordPress. Uh, uh, Ryan McHugh is the director of engineering there. He is also the technical lead of the WordPress REST API project. And we are, uh, he's going to be talking about what happens next with WordPress. What's next generation WordPress? And uh, the time is now yours, Ryan. Thank you very much. Uh, how's everybody doing this afternoon? Are you still with me or are you like half asleep? Uh, woo! Um, cool. So we've had a pretty hectic day of, uh, of talks. Uh, I'm going to close it down with something a little more, you know, high up there, get you thinking and all that sort of stuff. It, um, it won't be too heavy, so don't worry. Um, as Ryan mentioned, I'm Ryan McHugh, Director of Engineering at Human Made. We are an enterprise WordPress agency. Uh, I am the founder of the WordPress REST API uh, and now the tech lead on the project. And I'm here to talk to you today about next generation WordPress. WordPress needs to continue moving forward. We have a lot of competitors in the marketplace. We have a stated goal of hitting 51% of the web. Uh, and to continue making forward strides, we need to rethink how we work. So the best way to start thinking about this, start thinking about what will our next generation of WordPress be, is to first look at where we've been. This is the very first WordPress site. Um, this was in December 2003, just after it forked from B2. Uh, you might have noticed there's actually a small mistake on this page. Uh, so if, if you ever get annoyed that somebody misspelled WordPress, uh, don't forget that we used to do it too. Um, the fork of WordPress uh, from B2 started the 0.8 cycle uh, way back in those early days. And then that continued on to the 1.0 and 1.2, 1.5 cycle. Uh, we've had four major version cycles, although versioning in WordPress doesn't really work that way. Uh, we reached 1.0 in 2003. Uh, 1.5 then added pages, plugins, and themes. And with pages, we started to see the first beginnings of what would later become a CMS. Uh, but at the time, they were very secondary to posts. Uh, basically, the project noticed that people were kind of hacking static content into their sites. And so they figured, hey, maybe we should add some static content ability. We then hit version 2.0 in 2005, and that started the 2.x development cycle, where versions switched over to what we know now, which is essentially that major versions don't matter. In the 2.x cycle, we revamped the admin multiple times, including a major redesign called Crazy Horse. Uh, that was then refined a couple of versions later and continually refined throughout the rest of the cycle. We also added revisions, and we further improved the CMS experience. Uh, pages became a first-class citizen in the CMS. Uh, we added static front page support. We added draft and private pages, and that was the beginnings of post statuses as well. It was in the 2.x cycle that WordPress really started to become a CMS with all these extra tools that you could use to actually manage your content rather than just simply publishing. In 2010, we hit version 3.0. It started the 3.x release cycle. Uh, in 3.0, we merged multi-site and started the feature projects concept. The feature projects concept is something that has remained around until today, where features are developed completely separately, and then when they're ready, they're merged into WordPress core. We also crucially added custom post type support and taxonomy support with full developer APIs during the 3.x cycle. Version 3.7 also added auto updates. And yet again, we redesigned the admin. We've now been on the 4.x cycle for two and a half years, uh, pushing on to three years. The admin has been tweaked further because we can't stop touching it. Uh, but the customizer has actually taken over a lot of what the admin has traditionally done. The 4.x cycle has mostly been focused on refinement so far, polishing what is already a well-established CMS there haven't really been any huge paradigm shifts so far. However, we've started to see the growth of a new era of WordPress. Traditionally speaking, there have been two major ways to use WordPress, either as a blogging platform or as a CMS. We're now seeing the birth of the third era, which is the platform era. The CMS era 
has dominated most of the WordPress cycle that we know about. The 1.0 cycle didn't last that long, and both 2.x and uh, 3.x have been largely focused on the CMS. In WordPress 4.7, as you may know, we introduced the WordPress REST API, which has been in development for about four years uh, and is now part of WordPress core. This was a very large developer-only feature, which are rare to come across in WordPress. Uh, this is a feature which I think will form uh, the base of further developments into the platform era. In WordPress 4.8, which is our current release cycle, we're going to take this developer feature and use it to build better user experiences, improving the admin to be more uh, responsive and flexible, and just a better experience for end users. So now that we're on to the eighth release of the 4.x cycle, we need to ask ourselves, what should this cycle have been about? What legacy should the 4.x cycle leave? This is mostly based on refinement so far, but we've now got this concept of the birth of the platform era. But what does platform actually mean? Um, we, we need to ask this question to ourselves so that we know where we're headed and uh, how we're doing so far. Matt Mullenweg has stated that WordPress is a, an operating system for the web. So we need to treat the platform era as our next generation. If we're going to build an operating system for the web, we need to offer a compelling developer experience. The whole idea of being a platform is that we're offering a tool for developers. We're not purely focused on end users anymore. So, to move from the CMS generation to the next platform generation, we need to focus on three very large areas. We need to update our philosophy to recognize developers. We need to update our process to incorporate design for developers. And we need some big projects to modernize WordPress and make it attractive. Our core philosophies in WordPress have stayed basically the same since the very early days. Three of them that you might be very familiar with are the strict adherence to backwards compatibility, the design for the majority principle, also called the 80-20 rule, and the decisions, not options rule. But all of these philosophies are really from one key philosophy, which is that the user always comes first. This often comes at the expense of things like developer comfort. But we need to think more deeply about what this statement means and ask who our users are. Traditionally, we've meant non-technical users, the end users of the web. But for us to be a platform, we need to treat developers as those first-class citizens. When we think about user experience, we usually only think about those end users. And you don't actually hear the term UX applied to developers that often. But we need to consider the developer user experience as a whole. Developers are as much users as anyone else. We are building things that they can go out and use. Our internal and external APIs both need design just as much as the front end or the admin needs it. Developer user experience can be shortened to ducks. And even better, there's an emoji for that. So I'd like to propose a brand new core philosophy, which is to recognize that developers are users too. To become a platform, we really need to recognize that we're not just building for those end users, for those people actually making the sites, but we need to accommodate the people in between as well. Spoiler alert for anybody who didn't know, WordPress sucks. It's absolutely terrible. I'm guessing most of you probably knew something about this, having developed with WordPress, uh, but there's a pretty general acceptance that WordPress sucks. Uh, people both inside and outside the community think this. In 2016, Stack Overflow did a developer survey of thousands of users, and 75% of them said they dread working with WordPress. Is this just an image issue? Partially. We have made steps to make our platform better. However, there's still plenty of parts of WordPress that suck, and you can tell this from internal surveys. Rast created a survey which gauge the reaction to all the different internal APIs that WordPress has. 
and you'll see that they're pretty across the board. There's nothing uh, here that really ties all these together. WordPress is a mixed bag of things that people like and hate. Rewrites, for example, is a widely used API, but 58% of people don't like working with it. On the other hand, three quarters of people like working with custom post types. So there's a huge disparity between these internal APIs. The problem, as I see it, is that nobody really cares about improving this experience. We're very focused on improving things for the end users, but we don't really care about the developers that have to actually work with this code. But why should we care about the developer experience? Obviously, you know, this is a developer conference, so you're probably thinking, oh, no, no, definitely care about developers, they're the greatest. But we need to justify this to the wider world. Traditionally, WordPress has cared about end users. We think about WordPress, it is a product, and the users are people who have blogs, people who have sites. But now as we move towards becoming a platform, we need to rethink this approach. Developers are a crucial new use case, one that we haven't traditionally catered for. By empowering developers, we help them serve end users. This encourages more developers and creates better experiences for end users. By helping developers, they're building better tools for the users in the end. It's also important to come back and think about what got us here. Traditionally, we've always focused on that end user. But as Matt said in the state of the word, what got us here won't get us there. We need to radically rethink what we're doing as we move into the next generation of WordPress. And also, there's totally selfish reasons. You know, we're developers, we want to make our jobs easier, our life better. If that helps end users in the end, that's absolutely great. But we should never forget that in the end, we are here to provide things to the users as well. So we also need to change our processes to better serve developers. So let's talk about how WordPress works right now. What are the actual processes? Traditionally speaking, WordPress has used an incremental approach. This is in contrast to the grand design approach used by projects like Drupal. This means that the gro code base grows organically as we build things on top of other things. However, this organic growth means that we're constantly building on top of what we already have. When the stuff that we're building on top of sucks, we keep building more on top of that and it sucks worse. We never really throw away the code that we've written. We never really rethink our initial assumptions. This is very visible in the custom post types uh, architecture. We started with posts, which started with B2 and continued into WordPress. We then added pages, which only happened in version 1.5. This then eventually became custom post types. But in the wake of it, it's left a huge legacy and it's left a lot of technical debt. This is completely backwards from a grand design approach, something that Drupal might do, where they would design the most generic case, in this case custom post types, and then build specific things on top of that. Building organically and incrementally is great for end users. They get to see features quicker as we prototype them out, ship them, and then refine them. However, for developers, it means technical debt that we need to deal with all the time. When you're creating a custom post type, and you want to store JSON, for example, for that custom post type, you can't store it in the post content because that has formatting filters applied to it. This is not something that would have happened had we started with the grand design approach instead. But that's not necessarily to say that grand design is better. It's quite often not possible to see into the future and see where we're going with these things. And when we do, we often get it wrong. Taxonomies are a classic example of this. We borrowed the concept of taxonomies from Drupal, where we tried to take what made categories great and what made tags great and extend that and make it more generic. We designed this system of taxonomies. We had to redesign that later because we screwed it up completely from the start. At the start of 2013, or the end of 2012, uh, the Contributor Summit was held. And at the Contributor Summit, we tried to work out how do we actually fix this problem? We have this gigantic problem in WordPress, and we now need to retrofit everything to fix this. Halfway through that year, we finally came up with an actual solid plan to do that, and then it took two years just to enact 
that plan. This is something that doesn't go away quickly if we screw it up. So what we need to do is we need to refine our process and we need to incorporate design for developers into that initial build out of the feature. We need to recognize as well that we can't plan for everything, but we can try and plan for some things. But what about the features that we already have? We can't always start from scratch with a blank page. How do we make progress without breaking backwards compatibility? Because that would suck for the end user. We need to take the reality that we have and improve upon it. How do we do that? What we can do is we can take WordPress and flip it on its head. The current WordPress architecture looks a little something like this. We have a blogging platform, and on top of that, we've grafted a CMS. On top of that, again, we're trying to build a platform. Rather than building the generic pieces on top of the specific ones, what if we flip this upside down instead? We started with something very generic, and we made it more specific as we went. Rather than plugins having to undo blog fun functionality, what if they had to opt into it instead? But how do we actually go about rebuilding this now that it's done? There's three main steps that we can do here. Number one is to write a wrapper. This is a brand new API built on top of the legacy APIs. This takes what we already have, brings it into the modern era, although under the hood, it's still using all of that legacy stuff. The second step is that we need to test everything. I mean, 100% coverage of everything you can pass in. This ensures that when we later change it, we don't have regressions, we don't lose features, we don't introduce new bugs. Eventually, when it becomes time, we flip the wrapper. We change the new API to being the base low-level API, and the old API to being a legacy backwards compatibility wrapper around the brand new one. The advantage of this is that we retain backwards compatibility. Those old legacy pieces never actually go away, but they just become less and less relevant. They can all get moved out into a legacy.php or something like that. This specifically isolates, uh, isolates pieces of technical depth. Rather than having to deal with you know, old parameters that we used to pass into functions or return values or things like that, we can isolate that and move it off into its specific layer. For this modernization to work, we need actual concrete projects to push WordPress forward. It's great to say all these things, but we need something actually solid that actually works in reality. These projects need to set the standard of how we move forward with WordPress. So let's take an example with something like WP insert post. You've probably all used this function at some point and the behavior of it might not have been exactly what you expected. It's a very low level API. It writes the database directly and it hasn't changed much in a long time. So why should we change it? What do we have to gain by doing this? Well, WP insert post actually silently hides some of the errors, specifically database writing errors, caching errors, things like that. The problem with WP insert post is that it's a God function. It does way too much. Not only does it create a post for you, it will also attach tags, it will sticky the post for you, it cleans caches, it updates other caches, changes meta values. What we can do instead is come up with a simpler version that is more specific simplifies the code, and we can reason about much easier. So the first step to modernizing this API is to write our wrapper. In this case, it's called WP Post Create. Internally, this calls our legacy function, WP Insert Post, which then calls out to the database and the term writing and things like that. The second step is to test it and get 100% coverage across everything. I've left this step off the slides because tests are just so many lines of code that I'd probably need another room worth of projectors just to show the tests. The third step, after we've got the tests in place, we're certain that we're not going to break anything, is to actually flip this around. We now have our legacy function, WP insert post, calling our brand new API, WP post create, which calls out to the database. WP insert post continues to do those legacy things mapping from old values to new ones, and handling all the things that we're removing. 
giant bonus that we get from this is that we can finally remove slashing from a low-level function. If you've ever worked with many of the low-level functions, specifically WP insert anything, or add metadata, update metadata, things like that, you'll have had to work with slashing. This was, let's say, a bad decision um, early in the days of WordPress where magic quotes were added to all input data and then removed at a very low level. Uh, we later worked out that this was a terrible idea, but it's now way too late to change this. By building these wrappers and executing this strategy, we can remove WP slash from all of our low-level code. This gives us a brand new creation method. But we shouldn't just stop here while we're thinking about this. Maybe we can finally fully embrace custom post types. Why should posts be any different to any other custom post type? Because of legacy, posts are still the most important type in WordPress. We focus on them all the time. But for many sites and for many end users, they're not the most important thing on their site. For people using WordPress as a CMS, they're quite often focused on static pages. For people working with e-commerce, products are much more important. And for people that have in installed Jetpack, they might want to use comics, because Jetpack includes that. What if we apply the same technique, the same three-step process, to rewrites? Rewrites are an extremely simple API built into WordPress, which was designed for the blogging error. It maps a URL to a post query. And yet, everybody hates it. Why do they hate it? Traditionally speaking, rewrite rules have looked something like this. They take a URL coming in, they take some pieces out of that and match it, and they pass those into a WP query. But what happens when we have a more complex route, something that doesn't involve the post query, or something that does something more complex with that? Well, in any other framework, we would use something like this, which takes a route that we pass in, usually specified as a regular expression, and then calls a function. And that function can return something or do something within it. Uh, Slim, Laravel, Symfony, Drupal, all of these work basically the same. But what does this look like in WordPress? Well, in WordPress, we have to map our URL to an internal query var. We then need to take that query var and register it, because we can't have unregistered query vars. We then need to later detect the presence of that query var and do something based on that. This is actually quite a simple example, but when you start getting into the more complex routes that things like BuddyPress, BBPress, WooCommerce do, it gets very complex very quickly. So what if instead of all of this code, we could simplify it down and simply call a callback instead? This is much more familiar to people outside the WordPress space, and it also helps all of us within the WordPress space. In fact, we could take our earlier built-in query and rewrite it using that same method, keeping backwards compatibility. This flips rewrites from being a blog-first tool to a platform-first tool. We've broken the dependency between the rewrite system and the blogging system. While we're here, what else can we do? Well, we could create a page that just shows the login form in eight lines of code. If you have a look at the way that custom login pages do this right now, you will see many, many more lines of code. One plugin that I checked had over 400 lines of code for basically exactly this. But we'll need to adjust other parts of the system as well. The theming system, for example, is very much focused on blogging uh, and would not be that adaptable to this system. But this gives us a brand new world of possibilities. We don't even know what we could do with this system until we start trying to do it. So how do we go about executing this? Well, we use the same three-step process that we tried before. The first step is creating a wrapper. We create something that replaces add rewrite rule, maybe WP rewrite add, something like that. It doesn't have to be called anything particularly special. It just needs to be different. The second part is that we test it. We make sure that everything that works currently is going to work with the new stuff. With rewrites, this is actually extremely hard because WordPress is not re-entrant. In other words, you can't run rewrites multiple times. So just to make it testable, we already need to refactor 
a bunch of the internal code. There's a ticket open for this with quite a large patch on it as well. This testing is hard, and it's going to take time to do, but it improves the quality of the code for everybody by testing this. Once we have the tests in place for the old and the new, we can finally flip the wrapper and move add rewrite rule off into a legacy function. As a bonus that would come out of this, we could get rid of flushing. We could remove the need for rewrites to be stored in the database at all. The only reason they are is because they were designed before modern caching APIs in WordPress existed, and nobody's thought to change them until now. This will remove an entire class of problems that people run into. You never have to worry about activating a plugin and flushing rewrite rules. You don't have to go to the permalinks page and hit save. It just works. You don't have to execute the Technically, you do not. One of the other things that we can add that would improve developers' lives is auto-loading. Auto-loading changes WordPress to only load what's actually needed. It's a common technique in most PHP projects. In fact, all of the projects that I looked at, which is all the ones on this slide and about 40 more, all use auto-loading. But there's one missing from that. It's important to note that auto-loading is a trade-off. Specifically, what we're trading off is time and memory. By only loading the pieces that we need, we reduce the memory usage for most pages. However, because of this new dynamic feature, it's going to take longer to load. Most of the time, the actual time that that would change is pretty negligible. However, the memory is not. Currently, WordPress simply loading all of the files uh, in the code base is 15 megabytes of memory. If we change this to use auto-loading, we can significantly reduce this number. For a lot of people in this room, that number might not matter. You can simply ask your service team to bump up the memory or buy bigger machines. However, for people running this at huge scale and for people running it at tiny scale on shared hosting, this matters a lot. But it's important that we don't go overboard. Auto-loading is a trade-off, and we need to recognize that and not say, oh, we need to auto-load everything, because a lot of WordPress is actually used on every page request. So we need to get a balance of the two. There's a ticket for auto-loading open on track, uh, and one of the suggestions that came up very quickly was to use Composer. Composer generates an auto-load map for us automatically. But I don't feel like Composer is the best solution. It does improve the developer experience, but I don't think it improves it enough. And importantly, it doesn't actually offer any new APIs to plugin and theme developers. It adds a tool that they can use, but is actually harder to use and harder to provide a good user experience with. And we risk overcomplicating the development process. It's crucial to WordPress that developers are still able to pick it up and actually do things in it, even with a low level of knowledge. We can't make it into something like Drupal, where you need to understand gigantic class hierarchies and the interplay of Drupal and Symfony and other uh, libraries together. While we're talking about Composer, I'd be remiss not to mention plugin dependencies. I think plugin dependencies are really important and that they would really change the developer experience. I've actually written about this topic before. We need to explore how we can empower developers by introducing something like this. But the challenge is not the technical challenge. It's very easy to actually implement plugin dependencies. We could do it with one of these two methods, for example, and we could be done probably within the week. What we need to worry about is the end user usability. We're building out developer APIs, but we can't forget those end users. Particularly with plugin dependencies, we can run into issues with conflicts. Let's say plugin A requires library A, plugin B requires library A, but they require mutually incompatible versions of it. How do we deal with that? We can't simply pass this off onto the user and say, hey, these things don't work. This has been the traditional argument against plugin dependencies. But the thing that most people fail to realize is that this is actually already a problem. You can already have two plugins that have mutually incompatible versions of libraries, but quite often they'll just make your site white screen 
or the plugin will fail to activate because of a fatal error. These are problems that we can help deal with, and we can improve the user experience by adding a codified way to actually deal with conflicts. So while it might introduce potential problems, these problems often already exist. What if we think even bigger about how we can change WordPress? I've mentioned some very specific things here, but what if we decided to throw everything out? What could we do without limitations? Or what if we took WordPress, which is traditionally a monolithic project, managed in a single subversion repository, using track, and we split it up into hundreds of components? This is not entirely crazy. The Atom text editor by GitHub actually does this. Every piece of functionality in Atom, except for the part that actually loads the plugins, is a plugin itself. For example, the About screen in Atom is a plugin. If you don't want the About screen, disable the plugin. Every key feature is a plugin. It's not too hard to imagine this same technique applied to WordPress. What if, instead of writing plugins to disable things, you simply disable the blogging plugin? This doesn't have to hurt the user experience either. We can bundle this just like Adam does. Additionally, we can change the development process. By splitting up into a bunch of smaller repositories, it becomes easier to deal with and reason about each of those components. And in doing so, we can move them into GitHub. The argument against moving to GitHub in the past has been that it does not have a very complex system of managing issues and things like pull requests. That's why tracks required. However, by splitting up WordPress completely into smaller components, we could easily move to GitHub. This allows giving more power to the component maintainers who would be in charge of their own plugins. This is also not a crazy idea because we actually already do it. Bundled themes in WordPress are typically developed on GitHub and then merged in just before the release cycle. Why can't we do this with other parts of WordPress? What makes a bundled theme any different from another piece of functionality? Before we take all these pieces out and separate them, we need to ask ourselves, what actually is WordPress? It may seem blasphemous to talk about WordPress without blogging or without pages, but a lot of sites actually only use small features. They might only use static pages if they're just publishing a site, or they might only use WooCommerce products if they're just an e-commerce store. It's in important to explore these boundaries and think about what WordPress is. However, we also need to be very, very careful not to break WordPress. WordPress is and remains great software for a lot of end users, and we need to keep it that way. It might seem like a great idea to go and add things and remove things and break up, but if that hurts the user experience at the end of the day, we haven't really helped anything. But we need to recognize that we need to adapt and change to changes in the marketplace, to changes in the developer world. We can't stay the same if we want to hit 51%. So let's explore the next generation of WordPress. Let's renew our focus and look deeply at the three core areas that need change. We need to update our philosophies to recognize that developers are our users as well. We need to update our processes and get design involved with APIs from the very start. And we need big projects that modernize WordPress and set the standard for how we're going to move forward with this. Thank you. <laughs>